This is Alex Trebek, the intergenerationally beloved host of Jeopardy, who died at the age of 80 in November 2020. And when Alex died, he was remembered largely as the host of Jeopardy. That's his legacy. It's the first detail on his Wikipedia page, as well it should be. For 36 years, he starred as the host of what became the United States' premier quiz show. And he did so with a grace, an erudition, and a warmth that evolved over time as he mellowed into the role. He became a family presence for viewers. Alex's association with Jeopardy became so familiar to us, in fact, that it wove itself into the language of American culture. Jeez, I'll take elitist for 500, Alex. I'll take awkward dinner parties for 200, Alex. I'll take always embarrassing me for 500, Alex. Poor assumptions for 800, Alex. I'll take incontinence for 200, Alex. I'll take any other subject in the world for 200, Alex. So it's entirely fitting that Alex is remembered for this show. But today I want to expand that legacy a bit and show you how he was more than a great host of Jeopardy. He was simply a great host, a skilled practitioner of a show business craft. And instead of talking about Jeopardy, which everyone remembers, I want to talk about a show almost no one remembers. A dopey, short-lived, early 80s celebrity quiz show with an outer space theme and a format that was shamelessly stolen from a much more successful show. Today I want to talk to you about Battle Stars, the galactic trivia experience nobody wanted. It was in this futuristic setting that future Jeopardy host Alex Trebek encountered future person with a sitcom named after him, Jerry Seinfeld. That's right, baby Jerry Seinfeld. He's just one of the characters we'll meet along the way as I tell you the Battle Stars story. So sit back, relax, hey, maybe pick up the phone and call your friends and tell them it's time for another edition of Spin Again. When Alex Trebek debuted as the host of Jeopardy in 1984, he probably would not have imagined that the gig would eventually make him an icon. It would have been reasonable to hope for a hit, but it also would have made sense to expect a run of a year or two. That was the typical lifespan for a new game show, as Alex had experienced firsthand with the grab bag of games that he hosted in the 70s and early 80s. Shows like The Wizard of Odds, Double Dare, not the one you remember, and High Rollers, which had a split run, essentially, of four seasons on NBC in the late 70s. That was Trebek's biggest success in the U.S. before Jeopardy. In 1981, Trebek's journeyman career brings him to the podium of the far-out celebrity quiz slash trigonometric space fantasy Battle Stars. Press the button. You get number nine, Jimmy Bullock. Hello, hello, hello. Hey, Jimmy. How All right, you Jimmy, bad news. Your plums got too much sun and dried out. Now, what do you have? A soprano voice. I <laughs> <laughs> love you. We'll have lunch. Bye-bye now. Sun's had too much prunes and what? Uh, your plums got too much sun and dried out. Now, what do you have? Oh, prunes. Oh. I agree. That's the right answer, yes. Battlestars premieres in October 1981, and by spring of 1982, it's off the air. The sort of ephemeral program that a hardcore TV buff might recall years later and say, oh, I kind of remember that show. But then in 1983, NBC needs to temporarily fill a hole in its daytime schedule. And because it's daytime, they want to spend as little money as possible. So they reach into storage and order 13 more weeks of Battlestars to essentially act as time slot spackle until they come up with a different idea. And here's the part that I love. When Battlestars limps back onto the air, the producers have the temerity to brand it the new Battlestars. Like, hey, America, you know that game show you kind of remember and didn't really like in the first place? Well, this is the new that. And make no mistake, it was the same show. They changed the bonus round. They changed the rules a little bit. You know, complain in the comments if you want. But new Battlestars was the same show. And I love this word new. It's just a diamond that encapsulates the desperation of battle stars, the desperate need to cover up the truth, the secret shame, which is that battle stars isn't new at all. In fact, it's quite old. As Alex Trebek would later explain to late night host 
David Letterman. Now tell me about the uh, the game shows you've done. You've mentioned Wizard of Odds. High Rollers. High Rollers. I did Battle Stars, which uh, I used to refer to as the son of Hollywood Squares because we had just six celebrities instead of nine. Mm -hmm. We had triangles instead of oh, boxes. I, I kind of remember that show. I couldn't have said it better myself, Alex. Battle Stars is a triangular ripoff of the Hollywood Squares. If you've never seen the Hollywood Squares, it's a game of tic-tac-toe that uses B-list celebrities as the game board. They just took nine tic-tac-toe squares and they stuffed them all full of Hollywood. We'll call it the Hollywood Squares, they said, and they put it on TV. And it was a huge hit. A Merrill Heater and Bob Quigley production that ran for 14 seasons on NBC in the heart of the American Three Network era. Tic-tac-toe was just a gimmick. Scaffolding, literally, for a half hour of the show's real core mechanic, question, joke, answer. The host reads a trivia question. A little Bo Peep, little Bo Peep, what did the famous sheep leave behind them? The star makes a joke, a zinger, sometimes a line that's been pre-written by the show's staff. Well, Simple Simon thought they were breadcrumbs. <laughs> <laughs> and then the star answers the question in earnest. Uh, they left their tails behind them. Question, joke, answer. Now, at the end of all that, the contestant can either agree or disagree with the star's answer, and they earn the square if they're right, but that part is almost a formality. Each question on the Hollywood Squares is a variety show, and a quiz show distilled to their barest ingredients. Cue joke A. Now, in practice, there's not always a joke. Sometimes the star comes up with an elaborate bluff or just answers the question straight, right? The rhythm of the show does vary. But fundamentally, that Hollywood Squares formula is you just do that cue joke A cycle over and over for a half hour, and if you can keep up the pace with a lively variety of personalities, it starts to feel a little like a party. Well, sometimes it's hard to admit the party's over. I take you now to 1980, as Hollywood Squares concludes its final episode for NBC. The staff and crew come up, they join host Peter Marshall on stage to say goodbye to everyone. Yet, Squares co-creator Merrill Heater Apparently despondent over the demise of the show, he refuses to go up there with his partner Bob Quigley and all the rest of the staff. Marshall even goes so far as to make a bleak joke of it, as he begs his boss, please, not to kill himself. Mr. Quigley, uh, Mr. Heater, he, Mr. Heater, don't put that gun down, Mr. <laughs> Bob Quigley goes into retirement after this, but Merrill Heater just does not want the party to end. How do I know? Well, because Hollywood Squares had barely left the airwaves before Heater was back at NBC pitching his latest idea, and evidence suggests that the pitch to the network would have gone something like this. Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen of the NBC executive suite. I'm Merrill Heater. Thanks for the coffee. I'm here to present to you my latest concept. It's Hollywood Squares with half the budget, and I call it Battle Stars. That's right. Battle Stars was a ripoff of the Hollywood Squares, by a creator of the Hollywood Squares. This has been a Merrill Heater production. And I say it was a ripoff, but look at it from Heater's point of view. TV is a tough business. Most shows don't last. If you get a hit that somehow manages to endure, it goes against all your instincts to let that go. So to make this magical Hollywood Squares format marketable again, Heater cuts costs. Most prominently, by shrinking the panel of celebrities. We had just six celebrities instead of nine. Which takes a big chunk out of the talent budget right there. And not for nothing, you don't have to write Bob Quigley a check every week either. That probably helped a little. In any case, the pitch works. And the tight wads at NBC Daytime take Heater up on his offer. They give him the chance to revive the corpse of Hollywood Squares while the body is still warm. Of course, Heater knows the network needs a fresh angle too. NBC just canceled Hollywood Squares, so their position is that the viewers want something new. And Heater is ready for him there. He's like, hey, you want new? Let me lay this on you. You know those six celebrities I told you about? I'm going to put those fuckers in space. Outer space. Philip McKeon. <laughs> Debbie Reynolds. Jenny Lee Harrison. Rip Taylor. John Bowser Balvin <laughs> and Betty White. Those are the battle stars. If Discount Hollywood Squares was the value proposition to the network, the pitch to the audience is Star Wars, the game show. Because at this moment, America is deep in the first wave of Star Wars fandom. 
and TV is flooded with series that copy the Star Wars aesthetic. Although few copy Star Wars in the form of a campy quiz show, that indeed is the niche that Battlestars has all to itself. So that's the pitch. Look out, America, if you liked The Empire Strikes Back in 1980... Then get ready for Battlestars. It's got all those same outer space explosions. Charles Nelson Riley. But only these space explosions feature lovable showbiz got about Charles Nelson Riley. That's the conceit. But the core mechanic of Battlestars is still that old sawhorse question, joke, answer. In a recent survey, Charles, what did 96 out of 100 people say to a stranger with his fly open? (laughs) <laughs> Can I buy you a drink? <laughs> Where was this? In a recent survey, 96 out of 100 people <laughs> responded in this manner. <laughs> nothing. Miriam, is that right or I all? agree. Yes, 96 out of 100 said nothing. The Spaceballs aesthetic of Battlestars is not just an attempt to ride the coattails of a pop culture phenomenon, although it certainly is that. The main reason it's there is to conceal the Hollywood squaresness of this whole affair. It's a show exhaustingly and quixotically designed to not be what it is. Why triangles? Because they're not squares. That is a huge feature for the makers of Battlestars. If you put six squares on the screen, Jane Q viewer out there in TV land is going to say, hey, where'd the top row go? Where's Wally Cox? Where's Rose Marie? Well, you can't have that. If people get a whiff of Hollywood squares here, they're going to be disappointed, correctly so, with battle stars. Triangles it is, then. Of course, the problem with six triangles is that it's tough to make efficient use of the squarish TV frame with a bunch of triangles. That's the other beauty of squares. They do fit right in there, don't they? With these triangles, even if you do add those bulbous pinball bumper type things, you're still left with a lot of empty space in the frame. Looks kind of like a prison ship of Tinseltown B-listers hovering in a dark void. But then again, if your theme is Star Wars, where so much of the exciting laser action already takes place in empty space, well, Just dangle some Christmas lights in front of the wall, and then your dark void isn't a bug, it's a feature. You can see old Merrill Heater making it all fit together, can't you? More clever than we might first give him credit for. The spaceship that houses the Battle Stars also serves as the game board, where the object of the game is to capture triangles. Because what else would it be, I guess? Um, I'm not going to detail the rules here. They are needlessly complicated and contrived, again, to set it apart from tic-tac-toe, which is simple and familiar. And as part of this full-court press to not be Hollywood Squares, even though you're really Hollywood Squares underneath, you change the host to out with natty, smooth Hollywood Squares MC Peter Marshall and in with the younger, hipper Alex Trebek. Peter knew Trebek from a previous show, High Rollers. This has been a Merrill Heater, Bob Twiggly production. So he would have seen firsthand the style that Alex developed on that show, not the avuncular Professor Trebek of the later Jeopardy years. High Rollers Trebek has more of a jokey, macho swagger. He's flirty, even a little bit forward, but ultimately harmless. This is the last program of 1979. reason I'm wearing a tuxedo today is because I did it on the last show of 1978. Came out and told the people I wanted to be prepared for New Year's Eve in case I got invited to a party or something or got some good offers. As a matter of fact, I got a lot of good offers. Wound up selling the tuxedo for $140. I did all right. Now it's time to play our game. The guy who's looking for a party and ends up with an offer on his suit. It's a suggestive but not quite explicit sex appeal that's well calibrated to the standards of network daytime TV. And it's the energy Merrill Heater wants in his new Battlestars host. Welcome back to Battlestars. The producer of this show tells me that I always seem to treat the pretty female contestants a lot better than the handsome male contestants. I wonder why. Alex flirts with the women on the show because that's part of the package Battlestars is selling to its early 80s daytime audience composed predominantly of adult women. Part of what you get when you tune in is the opportunity to idly fantasize about this handsome, charming Canadian fellow with the mustache. And Alex's facial hair, in fact, became even more of an asset in the early 80s, as the success of the CBS action drama Magnum P.I. made Tom Selleck, 
with his bushy upper lip into an American sex symbol. Just another pop culture wave for battle stars to ride. This week, play along and go crazy with all your favorite Hollywood celebrities. Oh. On the new Battle Stars, the game show that'll blow you away faster than... A sperm whale with gas. Alex Trebek is your huggable host. Tom Selleck has nothing on you, Alex. When the new Battle Stars blasts off this week on NBC. It's funny now to see Alex Trebek positioned as a sex symbol, but any sex appeal Alex may have possessed was a fringe benefit. His value to battle stars was mainly that he was a game show host, by which I mean an experienced broadcaster who knew how to manage the unpredictability of a game within the constraints of a half-hour taping. The host is an on-camera producer, by which I mean that after all the big creative decisions have been made, the host is the one who goes out there and actually operates the machine, right? Alex has to take this jumble of trivia, broken game rules, low-wattage celebrity, and sci-fi foo and make sense of it for you, the audience, in real time. And despite all the sci-fi obfuscation, the recipe for success here on Battlestars is the same as it was on Squares. Question, joke, answer, and repeat. So Alex's two main tasks are, one, make the stars look funny, and two, keep the show moving. Laughter and pacing are the ingredients of that effervescent party atmosphere that you hope to generate with this format. So the focus of Alex's hosting, his real-time execution on tape day, largely comes down to the 30-second interactions he has one after another with the celebrity guests in this pointillized variety show setup. Which brings me to my favorite part, because I love to talk about the stars on these old panel shows. Every one of them has a story, their own journey through the glories and depredations of fame. And for the final section of our Battle Stars video, I want to look at the stories of two Battle Stars panelists in particular, Rip Taylor and a young Jerry Seinfeld, and show you what they can tell us about Alex Trebek as a host. Transport yourself now to the television morning of March 23rd, 1982, at 11.30 a.m., 10.30 a.m. Central. A small rebel contingent of the American TV public has escaped the tractor beam pull of the top-rated juggernaut, The Price is Right and have tuned their dials instead to NBC's Battle Stars. Where today the lineup includes actor and entertainer Debbie Reynolds, whose painfully public personal history is approached with subtlety and grace by the show's writers. Debbie, you've just found out your husband's had an affair. Oh. And yet... (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, this is an old question. Yes. Picture this scenario now, Debbie. (laughs) The worst moment of your actual life. (laughs) It's so cruel. But she doesn't mind. She takes that pain and turns it into something the crowd can enjoy. That's instinctive to a showbiz veteran like Debbie Reynolds, and those instincts are why she was booked on the show. As a bonus, she was Carrie Fisher's mom, so there's your coincidental Star Wars connection. Nell Carter, star of the NBC sitcom Gimme a Break, is here too as are Jenny Lee Harrison, one of the later replacement roommates on the sitcom Three's Company, and Charles Hayde, who plays a cop on the primetime drama Hill Street Blues. And like I said, each of the battle stars is their own wormhole of pop culture history, but most fascinating to me are the two comedians who are on the panel this week, one of them a creature of the wild and crazy 1970s, the other a young stand-up whose observational sarcasm would be a central influence on the comedy of the 1990s. And let me start with him. Nobody watching Battlestars that day could have possibly guessed that in a decade or so, NBC would be the country's number one network, arranging its primetime hits around the success of this guy, Jerry Seinfeld. In 1982, NBC was, and had been for some time, America's third place network, which, when you're living in the three network era, is bad. And despite its rather pathetic insistence that the network was proud as a peacock, NBC not as a In fact, NBC was a laughingstock even on its own air. What did the ancient Romans do when the peacock laid an egg? Same as NBC, they put it on the air. (laughs) (laughs) As for Jerry Seinfeld, he's just at the beginning of a stand-up comedy boom in the United States. Stand-up is about to become a huge presence in American culture with clubs springing up across the country and later, as a result, big TV deals for a whole generation of comics 
all of them hoping to make it big in the sitcom world, like Jerry Seinfeld. But on this day in 1982, Jerry seems content with this little gig, telling jokes and playing some silly game on a triangle spaceship. Watching it now, he seems both young and fully formed at the same time. Jerry, Go is ahead. Ronald Reagan right or left-handed? Aha, a good question for a guy like me. Because I am left-handed, and I know a lot about it. The, the word left itself is associated with negative things. Leftovers, they're terrible. Two left feet, left-handed compliment. On television, you ever see a crook named Righty? <laughs> you go to a party, there's nobody there. Where'd everybody go? They left. Boy, it sure did work out great that Jerry got a question on left-handedness, a topic about which he has, as he himself observes, a great deal to say. But of course, Jerry's stack of questions is tailored to his material. He would have been interviewed before the show, it's called a pre-interview, by the show's talent coordinator, Mary Downey. And Downey would have asked him what material he likes to perform. So he says, well, I do a bit about being left-handed. I have a bit about the TV weather report that I did on Carson. A photograph of the Earth from 10,000 miles away. Can you tell if you should take a sweater or not from that shot? All this gets passed along to the Battlestar's writing staff. They don't give Jerry the questions in advance. They don't have to. When he hears a question about the weather, he knows what to do. To a weatherman, Jerry, what blows hardest, a gale or a storm? <laughs> These guys have no idea. The guys that do the weather have no idea about the weather. That's why they have <clears throat> all those maps. You know, They show me constantly highs, lows, fronts. Then the most ridiculous part, the satellite photo. This is real helpful. <laughs> I mean, really, it's a photograph of the Earth from 10,000 miles away. Can you tell if you should take a sweater or not from that shot? <laughs> and by the same token, he knows that if a question doesn't reference his act, just go ahead and answer it. In a game of chess, which piece cannot move backwards? I know chess. The pawn. By coming on Battlestars, Jerry gets to experience from the inside of the machine how his material can be adapted to different forms within the medium of television how a set that he did on a late-night variety show can be reworked into 30-second chunks for the micro-variety shows embedded in Battlestars. Jerry's later genius would be to so innovatively adapt the sensibilities of his stand-up act to sustain them over the 30-minute arc of a sitcom. Battlestars gave him an early lesson in the sort of creative adaptability that he'd need to succeed on TV. If Jerry Seinfeld is Battlestar's vision of television future, Rip Taylor is a postcard from the immediate past, a creature of a loud, zany, orange shag carpeted TV aesthetic that was fading from the airwaves by 1982. Rip? Yes, baby. <laughs> Rip. Don Ho. <laughs> Sorry. Rip. I'll call you back. Stop it. Rip, think back to your last dinner party. You're chewing something distasteful. According to etiquette, what should you do? Drop her like a hot potato. <laughs> what are we owing about? What's it, the gong show? <laughs> If you didn't understand the Don Ho thing, uh, Don Ho was a popular singer, and Rip put together a thing that kind of sounded like that guy's name. Not much to think about in that joke, which is why Rip doesn't give you the time to think about it. Bang, 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 that's his rhythm, right? We talk about Jerry Seinfeld carefully compressing his act into a 30-second box. For Rip, on the other hand, no compression necessary. Half a minute is an ocean for this guy, because he works in two-second bursts. He provokes the audience, gets a rise out of us, and then as soon as the energy starts to dip just a little, he provokes us again. Seinfeld sits back, lets the punchline breathe. Rip screaming at us. This is beautiful! He just keeps poking you in the ribs until you can't breathe. Can't help but laugh. I mean, I think he's hilarious. You may find him obnoxious. He dances on that knife's edge. Either way, his style was emblematic of a manic sensibility that emerged in the American TV of the 70s as the mainstreaming of late 60s youth counterculture and the rise of color TV set the stage for a hard pivot against the restrained, polite, monochrome trappings of mid-century broadcasts. 
few performers were better equipped to thrive in the irreverent, loud, campy environment of the new TV generation than Rip Taylor, who let his zany style grow with the times. Watch a clip of Rip on The Ed Sullivan Show in 1964, and the Rip Taylor energy is there, but it's like a simmering pot on the stove. Her hair was teased so high, she caught three pigeons in a crosstown bus. <laughs> I laughed so hard, I almost fell off my giraffe. <laughs> Compare that to 1978 Rip Taylor, where, as the host of a spoof pageant called the $1.98 Beauty Show, the outlandishly attired Rip would open every episode with his now trademark entrance, which was to shower the audience with a paper bag full of confetti. The winner is... Oh, I, my hair is lifting. <laughs> Kim Marshall! The $1.98 Beauty Show was created by a producer named Chuck Barris, who also created and hosted the iconic 70s program The Gong Show, which was a talent show where talent was optional. On The Gong Show, both the celebrity judges and the studio audience were encouraged to let their opinions be known loudly. <laughs> That's why when the Battlestar's crowd starts to groan at Rip's antics, he invokes the ghost of the gong show as a symbol of that rowdy, earthy 70s dynamic between the audience and the performer. What are we owing about? What's it, the gong show? So here on this same Battlestar's panel, we have a comedic voice of the past and one of the future. What does all this have to do with Alex Trebek and hosting? Well, I'm going to show you, but the truth is I've already shown you. You just probably didn't notice, and that's the way it's supposed to be. Watch the clips of Jerry and Rip's questions again, but this time just pay attention to Alex. Listen to the way he handles Rip. Rip. Don Ho. <laughs> <laughs> Can you see this? It's beautiful. Okay. I'm sorry. Rip. I'll call you back. Stop it. Rip. And then the way he handles Jerry. Did you ever see a crook named Righty? <laughs> doesn't laugh at any of Rip's antics. Instead, he feeds him this steady beat of rip, rip, rip. Sorry, rip. I'll call you back. It's supposed to sound like he's trying to make Rip calm down and focus, but what Alex is actually doing is playing the straight man. He knows Rip Taylor. He knows who this guy is. Rip was a regular on Battlestars. And Alex knows that every time he says rip in this stern voice, He's creating an expectation of calm and order that Rip can play off of by flying off in another direction. Compare that to Alex's dynamic with Jerry Seinfeld. When Seinfeld arrives at his punchline and Alex fills the ensuing quiet with this extended laugh, <laughs> that laugh is Alex's intuitive recognition that Seinfeld's working with a different comedic rhythm than Rip Taylor is. Jerry's not slam-bang like Rip. This punchline about... You ever seen a crook named Righty? The wordplay by design takes an extra half second to play out in the viewer's mind, right? Alex interjecting his long laugh gives the punchline a moment to grow. It also, I don't think by accident, allows Jerry a moment to catch his breath, because as you may have noticed, he's nervous. He stumbles, his throat catches as he tries to segue from the question to his material. Alex's laugh is a way for Alex to say to Jerry, great job, pal, you're doing just fine without actually saying it out loud. These may seem like small moments because they are. That's how this Hollywood Squares type format is built in discrete 30 second interactions, one right after the other until it's time to say goodbye. Every time the contestant calls on a different celebrity, which happens 15, 20 times an episode, Alex has to imperceptibly shift gears because the energy a host can bring to support a Rip Taylor best is different than for a Jerry Seinfeld, or a Nell Carter, or a Debbie Reynolds, and so on. You have to be versatile to stay light on your feet amid that chaos. And that sort of versatility is what defines the career of Alex Trebek in my eyes. He was ready for the demands of a format like Battlestars because his career from his early days on Canadian TV had pressed him into service for all manner of programming. A high school trivia contest, an American bandstand-style pop music show, classical music broadcasts. Glenn Gould will now play Beethoven's Sonata No. 17 in D minor. High and low culture and everything in between. He could even break out a little stand-up comedy if the moment called for it. Really? You go to Las Vegas? I went to Las Vegas once, and I came back with $25,000. Hey, you did good. No, I went with $50,000. <laughs> 
Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. Well, I gotta shoot. stick to game shows. Alex did a little bit of everything, and in doing so, he developed a versatility that allowed him to handle whatever the B-listers on Battlestars might throw at him. And by the same token, the versatility to act as a calm authority on the wide range of knowledge he presented on Jeopardy over the years. Battlestars, unlike Jeopardy, was not a great show, but what the two shows had in common was a host who could bring out the best in any format you placed him in, who understood the rhythms of broadcast TV down to his bones and could almost invisibly shape it from moment to moment. Make the show go, that's the task of the host. And even on a doomed clunker like Battlestars, nobody did that better than Alex Trebek. That's the story I wanted to tell you today, but here's the epilogue. In 2010, Rip Taylor reflected on his career in a one-man stage show called It Ain't All Confetti. Spotted in the audience for opening night were the sort of comedians you'd expect to love Rip Taylor. Bruce Valanche, Kathy Griffin, like can't be over-the-top types, right? But there also was Alex Trebek. Nearly 30 years after Rip was a regular guest on Battlestars, Alex showed up to support his former colleague. It shows me not only that Alex was a real decent guy, but also that Alex appreciated Rip's talents. He appreciated the craft behind Rip's apparently unhinged zaniness. But of course he did. A host's job is to bring out the best in those around them. And to bring it out, first you have to see it. That's what I love about hosting. It compels you to see the best in people, and then to draw it out. And ultimately, I think that this is what we loved about Alex. As host of this long-running show, Jeopardy!, it felt like he was drawing out the best in us. He made us feel smart, right? Or at least by the end of each half hour, smarter than we were before. It felt like he appreciated the best of us. And I hope maybe after this video, you have a better appreciation for the best of Alex. That's all for this edition of Spin Again. If you had a good time, remember, click that subscribe button. More to come. Thanks for watching. I love you. Bye for now.